Have you ever wondered if you could have like a 3D map of the nearby universe? I mean, we talk about Gaia all the time and how we're really starting to learn the location, the position, the movements of the stars around us. But there are other surveys going on to map all of the galaxies that are around us. There's a couple you should know about. One is called the Sienna Galaxy Atlas. And this is several hundred thousand galaxies that are which are roughly the same size in the sky and smaller and in our vicinity. And then there's a much larger survey that is going on by the Dark Energy Survey Instrument that is mapping out tens of millions of galaxies and quasars really out to the edge of the observable universe just a billion years after the Big Bang, trying to understand the role of dark energy in the universe. My guest today is Dr. John Moustakas. He is a professor at Siena College. We talk about both the Siena map and then this larger survey that's been done to search for dark energy in the universe how you should be able to see the presence of dark energy at different time scales in the universe and try to get a sense of what the future holds for. So enjoy this interview with Professor John Moustakas. How well do we understand our extragalactic environment? So that's a big question. Uh, and like many things in astronomy, we have to talk about the right scale. Uh, so extragalactic means anything outside of our own galaxy, which is actually a story I'm hoping we'll get into because that story really just didn't begin until about 100 years ago. Uh, that, you know, the fact that we're one galaxy in um, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. Um, so I would say we, as, a, as an astronomer that works on in this area, uh, we I feel like to some degree we've been lulled into a false sense of security in thinking that we understand our nearby universe better than we think we do. Uh, so a lot of the focus um, in astrophysics um, is, you know, deeper, further, fainter, edge of the universe kind of stuff. You know, JWST obviously has like just lit a fire under that um, that uh, scientific you know goal. Um, but there's a lot that uh, we still need to learn from our own uh, cosmic neighborhood. Um, so the bigger question is, you know, do we understand how galaxies form, um, why they look like they do, how do they change with time? Uh, that's very much an open question uh, still. Is it like, you know, people always say we understand the surface of Mars better than we understand our own ocean. Do you, okay. you know, is it sort yeah. of like that kind of a situation that we've studied our galactic neighborhood thanks to missions like Gaia, but, and, and we are starting to piece together the early universe because it's so mysterious, but the nearby galaxies, the stuff out to say a billion years just doesn't get the kind of love. <laughs> uh, right. Good. So no, I think it's, um, it's been, uh, you know, with, with astronomy, the, our understanding has improved with instrumentation, right? Where we are um, dependent because we don't have, as scientists, as astronomers, and this is one of the draws of the sciences, we don't have the ability to uh, go and grab a galaxy, you know, bring it over, throw it in our lab, poke it, burn it, uh, you know, what my, my chemistry and biology colleagues can do. Um, so we're, we're kind of frozen in not only space uh, in where we are in the universe, but also in time, uh, because although the universe is dynamic and it's changing, it's changing on timescales that are hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. Uh, so it's like trying to piece together an entire movie from a single frame <laughs> of that movie. Um, but we have some advantages and we can get into that the idea that the further away something is, the further back in time, uh, we're looking because the speed of light is finite. We are still trying to understand our own Milky Way galaxy, which is a very important question. You mentioned Gaia, which of course is mapping stars uh, in our own Milky Way galaxy, trying to understand its formation. But be again, because we're, we're tied to where we are in the universe, uh, that's a really challenging problem. It's like trying to draw a picture of the house you live in sitting inside your bedroom, inside your closet. So we are improving our, our understanding and mapping of the Milky Way galaxy, but one way to do that as well and figure out what our galaxy looks like 
how the our own solar system fits into the galaxy is by looking at other nearby galaxies and trying to find analogs uh, and and draw connections between our galaxy and a family of other of many other galaxies that may have had similar evolutionary paths. So I think we we're continuing to understand we're continuing to study the Milky Way galaxy. We're continuing to study nearby galaxies, and we'll get into this, I'm sure because we can see them in such detail. Um, and then we're saying, okay, well, let's time travel. Uh, let's build a big telescope like JWST or a 10 meter telescope from the ground. Uh, and let's look at the more distant universe when perhaps the progenitors of today's galaxies, we hope, uh, we're able to observe what they look like then uh, and piece together that evolutionary story. So it's a multi-pronged approach, I would say, and and uh, we have not written the story of galaxy evolution uh, by any means. We've just, I think, opened up more questions. So let's talk about the atlas that yeah. you've built. You've built a, a, a 3D <laughs> atlas to our local part of the universe. Yeah, good. So uh, the... So nearby galaxies, so, you know, it's a large galaxy atlas. So what, let's talk about large. Uh, so large in astronomers speak uh, means something that appears large. So, for example, you know, my, my phone might appear large if I hold it up to the camera. But if I hold it very far away, it's going to appear small. So uh, in astronomy, getting distances is very hard. Uh, that's one of the... the the big challenge is knowing the, the literally how many meters from here to there uh, it is. Uh, and so absent that information, um, uh, so, so, so we're stuck with kind of the observational uh, piece, which is how, uh, how large something appears. Um, so the goal of this catalog or this atlas was to say, okay, well, let's, let's put in some extra effort into assembling the best possible data with the latest instrumentation and imaging uh, and metadata, so additional information about these galaxies um, for things that are large on the sky, have large uh, um, angular sizes on the sky. Um, now, the study of galaxy, you know, galaxies have been studied for since the invention of the telescope, really, since the early part of the 18th century. Um, and so people have been building catalogs of nearby galaxies, large galaxies. Uh, but the goal here was to, yeah, piece together, um, build a catalog that's the latest and greatest, has the, the best available data, um, and then apply the special care that you need in order to analyze um, images of large galaxies. And I can get into some of those challenges if you like. Right, but it's it's like you're seeing blobs on the sky that are the biggest blobs, right? And you so you know where they are and you know how big they are, but you don't necessarily know how far away they are. Right. So uh, getting their precise distances. I mean, many of these galaxies have been studied for a long time, so we actually do have distances to think of the Messiers and the NGCs. You know, these are. Um, yeah, have been hundreds of, of studies have been carried out, um, but there are many um, equally large galaxies, or maybe not equally large, but um, you know the largest things are the tip of the iceberg, right? These are the biggest, most famous things. Uh, but there's an important regime where things are still large and well resolved, like we can see in, inside them, we can see a lot of internal structure, um, but those have not been studied in as much detail. So the, um, this, the current atlas uh, that we're talking about here um, doesn't actually pull in um, all the, all the uh, precise distances or redshifts uh, to, um, to these galaxies. We have gathered kind of what exists, but it's a bit of a hodgepodge because maybe one survey observed some of these, another survey observed uh, another subset, but it's not complete. Um, However, all the galaxies in this catalog are being observed as part of another survey I'm involved in called the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. 
uh, which I looked up this morning has, uh, has measured precise redshifts to about 35 million galaxies. Uh, and when it's done, it's going to be 10 to 15 times larger than anything uh, that any other previous survey. So the first step was, okay, let's gather, let's build an atlas of, of just the images of these galaxies. So it's this, you know, my analogy of the phone, like how far, the, so not worrying about how far away things are. Uh, let's just gather the data on uh, using imaging, the imaging that we have available. The next step will be to pull in spectroscopy and redshifts uh, and other measurements uh, from like stellar populations from the STESI spectroscopy, uh, and then use that to kind of assemble a more physical picture of, of uh, the properties of these galaxies and then ultimately, you know, how they formed and, and, and how they ended up the way they did. It's interesting. We're shifting into a, a new era in astronomy. Like in the olden days, people would request time, time on a telescope because they wanted to study this galaxy or that galaxy or this white dwarf or whatever. And now it's very much survey driven, uh, database driven that you're like, show me, you know, computer, show me all the galaxies with a redshift this, yes. with metallicity that, and then, you know, out comes a database list of all of the ones and then they can write a paper. Yeah, and they didn't use even even use a telescope. Yeah, do do you see this as more and more the future of these giant surveys? Yeah, I I would say we we've been on that path for uh, a couple of decades now. Uh, you know, the early data release of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey came out when I was a second year graduate student. You know, in 1999, 2000. No, 2000. What am I saying here? Okay, um, don't date myself too much. So we've definitely moved to the survey model or mode where uh, you have a, a uniform survey of some form, uh, always driven by science, right? We don't, we're not um, arbitrary about how uh, we use our telescope time. It's not like, oh, I want to do this uh, for the sake of it. It's always science driven. Um, and that's, it's really been a, a huge force multiplier because now you have, you don't have to worry about what we call heterogeneity or sample selection as much because maybe I'm, you know, I measure some property of this galaxy, uh, and then, and then compare it to this other galaxy, but maybe I had deeper data on this one, or maybe I had, you know, additional data on this, on the other one. Um, and so if you see differences, well, are they different because it was, you know, what I, my inputs were different um, or, uh, or are they physically different, intrinsically different? That's what we're interested in, right? We want the physics. So surveys have been incredibly uh, powerful in that regard. Um, and, and that's one of my major areas of expertise is how do we, how do we design an experiment, um, uh, whether it's imaging or spectroscopy, um, and uh, to maximize the science. <clears throat> On the other hand, <laughs> you know, I do think we still uh, targeted observations actually still continue to play uh, an important role. And uh, frankly, a, a great example of that is the James Webb Space Telescope. I mean, it's uh, um, it's a six and a half meter telescope in space, but it is not a survey machine. You could not observe half the sky with JW, you know, check back in a few hundred years, uh, you know, your cryogen runs out well before then. But um, so that is a, you have to decide, okay, I want to observe these 10 objects uh, and this is why. And it's uh, extremely competitive to get time on JW. They are doing some surveys, um, but, uh, but you have to justify the derivatives, so to speak. What, what is the derivative of observing these objects and how will that allow us to draw broader conclusions about either that population or some astrophysical phenomenon? Uh, so, and, and even with surveys, and let me give you an example, uh, with this dark energy spectroscopic instrument, DESI survey, uh, we have a, there's a primary scientific goal, which is to try to understand dark energy. So the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the targets we observe are ones that will get at that question, that scientific question. But we have a, what's called a secondary program that's tiered on top of that. And we say, let's say we, we want to observe 
Uh, so with DESI, we have these robotic fibers that can move to capture the light of very specific objects. So if a certain fiber uh, doesn't have any primary target in its kind of patrol radius where it can where it can move to, we say, okay, well, let's rather than throwing away or not observing with that fiber, let's put it on a secondary target, on a target that has also been scientifically justified um, for whatever reason, um, uh, whether it's understanding the halo of the Milky Way or you want to try to, you mentioned metallicity, trying to observe the most metal poor galaxies in the universe that's an ongoing secondary program uh we can we can use the the survey mode and say you know what let's do 0.1 percent of our of our instrumentation we're going to dedicate to these other observations but because the the multiplexing is so large you know factors of a thousand ten thousand hundred thousand even 0.1 percent of that capability can still build up um impressive data sets of, of, of uh, you know, narrower populations of targets. So anyway, as astronomers, we're, you know, we're, we're desperate for photons. So wherever I can get the data. Uh, so we're definitely not in one mode or another. Uh, both, both roles have a, both modes have a role to play. So y you sort of like dropped some really intriguing information about how the dark energy survey works. Yep. Talk about moving um uh fiber optics around to to chase stars so so let's talk about like the, the dark energy survey instrument like how does this survey work yeah functionally right. good so the instrument is an incredible machine it's state-of-the-art instrument mounted on the four meter telescope at uh, the Mayall telescope four meter Mayall telescope at kip peak national observatory which is near tucson um, and that telescope is, you know, 50 years old. And, and there was about a, a decade there in the early 2000s where no one wanted it. Uh, it was too small, you know, four meters. You think about the largest telescopes on the ground. Boring. Uh, boring, yeah. right, exactly. Like, come on now. Uh, you know, eight to 10 meters today, we're pushing for 30 meter telescopes in the next decade. Uh, and it's this drive, right? F you know, deeper, fainter, more distant. Um, but, uh, but it turns out that if you put a, a modern instrument on it, a very sensitive instrument with, with robotic capabilities or, or um, multiplexing capabilities, the ability to make many simultaneous observations, uh, that you can crank out some very competitive science. So one of the, as, as you and your audience may know, one of the most important, arguably most important unsolved problems in astrophysics, maybe all of physics, uh, is dark energy. Uh, so what is this? We know the universe is expanding. We expect the matter, the gravitating matter in the universe to slow down that expansion because gravity only pulls. And yet we observe the expansion rate of the universe to be accelerating. You know, and when I teach, I, it's like throwing this pen up in the air and you expect it to come back down, and instead it, it accelerates upward and flies off into space. So if we observed that, we'd be like, what is going on? Uh, that is not any physics that's in any textbook uh, you can pull off your shelf. So we're trying to understand that um, empirically, observationally. Uh, and by the way to do that is to measure that expansion rate very precisely. Ultimately, we're hoping to build a physical model um, uh, of, of, of dark energy. So the way dark energy, uh, I'm sorry, the way this survey works um, is uh, the DESI instrument, so DESI, has 5,000 robotically positionable fiber optic cables, fiber positioning robots. So if you look at a chunk of the sky, you know, I can see my little Hubble Space Telescope image there, right? There's lots of tiny little Lots of big bright things, or a few big bright things, but lots of little tiny blobs of light. So in an image, uh, there are far more blobs of light than we can get a spectrum for. So spectroscopy, of course, is dispersing the light like a prism or a rainbow. And if you disperse the light, you can measure the redshift. And if you know the redshift, uh, and you um, and and uh, you can you can tie that to the um, to the energy, matter and energy content of the universe, which is what we're getting at. Um, so, so 
one of the challenges with dark energy is it's a cosmic, you know, it's on the cosmic scale. So you can't observe a little piece of sky. You could, you could not um, use something like JWST, for example, to, to tackle this problem. You need to observe a large patch of the sky. So by having these 5,000 fibers, we can put, move them to, to isolate the light of certain 5,000 objects at one time. Then we move the telescope to another patch of the sky, and in under two minutes, we've moved the fibers to another 5,000 set of objects. Uh, so to give you an example, last month, it's November, so in October, we got redshifts for nearly a million objects, galaxies, not stars now. Um, and so uh, that we started this survey in May 2021. Uh, so we're a little more than two years uh, into it, two and a half years. Uh, and we've gotten redshifts to over 30 million objects um, so far. And just to give an example, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which still dominates really a lot of the uh, science in astronomy, um, just like the Hubble does, you know, 25 years and counting, um, uh, has, I think, a little more than 3 million redshifts, galaxy redshifts in it. So we're 10 times larger um, in a fraction of the time. That, that original Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they had metal plates that they put in front of their telescope, and they yep. had holes drilled in it for where the galaxies are that they wanted to observe. And then they would move the telescope to a new position. They would pull off one plate, yep. put another plate in front that had holes that matched the galaxies. They'd take their exposure, and then they'd remove the, the plate. Yep. And so now, like having 5,000 robots that are moving these little fiber optic cables around, you're, yes. you're generating this plate dynamically in, yeah. in real time. And that, that gives you the speed to move from, from object to, to object. And so like, what is, have you, like, have you been beside the instrument while it's doing its work? What does it, what does it sound like? Uh, well, you don't want, um, sound. That's interesting. Like, I wonder if you can hear, no. can you hear the, the little robots moving their fiber optic cables around to the new position as it's mm. beginning to make its observation? Yeah. So interesting. I've not, um, well, so when you're observing, and I have been observing, um, you're, you're never out on the floor, so to speak, right? So you're in a control room. So you want your, uh, I mean, I guess you could stand out there, but once you're observing, you don't want any light, you don't want any contamination that's not, anything that's not the light of the object you're interested in is bad, so you minimize that. Um, I don't think it makes um, any audible sound hmm. because, you know, we think about, you might think about 5,000 things moving, but, you know, it's not a dump truck, right? Like, <laughs> like moving over <laughs> yeah. much. Like, it's moving millimeters, right? It's It's... And because the sky, you know, even though we're observing a big patch of the sky, big is all relative. So one single fiber is actually moving a very small physical amount kind of radially. Um, and so it's got like two, uh, it, it's got two um, degrees of freedom. So it rotates one way and then it can rotate another way. And so it's got a little patrol radius, which is, I mean, I have actually haven't thought of, I should draw this out on a piece of paper, but it's small. It's like smaller. Right, right, right. right? But like, good. but like, what is the field of view of the, of the full telescope? Yeah, good. So it's about um, eight square degrees. So it's, uh, so what is it? Oh, wow. It's three degrees on a side, three and a half degrees on the side. I mean, I'm getting in trouble here with my, with, with my colleagues, but I think it's about three and a half degrees on the side. So that's seven full moons. Uh, right. So it's an enormous field of view by comparison. You know, historically, um, uh, instruments have had very small fields of view. Uh, so this is very much pushing into new territory. Um, it's a what's called a stage four dark energy experiment, uh, which has to do with how precisely you're constraining the equation of state of dark energy. Uh, and there are no other stage four experiments. So I don't know if you've talked about Euclid yet. Euclid will be a stage four, is a stage four. It's now launched uh, last July. Uh, it'll take a couple of years, uh, but, um, you know, we've been running for about two and a half years now, and we're actually working on the science uh, thrust and concept for DESI-2. So this is a five-year survey. What's the next piece? But real quick, I want to go back and also say that um, in terms of being able to position things, uh, the ability to be dynamic with what we observe, 
also allows us then to, because uh, the other piece of it is all the data we took in a certain night. Well, what did we take? How good is it? Do we need to reobserve things? Uh, you know, what are the conditions? And so we actually, we, we say bread shifts by breakfast. Uh, so we finish taking our data morning twilight, uh, and then all the data are transferred to a supercomputing facility at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called NURSE. Um, and by, by the time a Pacific Coast, um, you know, member of the data systems team wakes up, we've actually reduced all the data, we have all the redshifts, we do the quality assurance, and then we use that to fold in, okay, so this is how yesterday went and what everything has gone up until then, what are we going to observe tonight? Uh, so it's incredibly dynamic, really on nightly timescales, which we didn't think we were going to be able to do at first. We thought we would need a monthly cadence to kind of reassess. Um, yeah. Now, now we talked about the, the the field of view of the entire instrument. What is the field of view of each one of the fiber optic cables? Yeah. So it's one and a half arc seconds. Um, so what's an analogy? It's small. <laughs> um, so uh, think yeah. Like Saturn is like what thirty arc seconds, I think. Okay. Um, I think I'm, of, I'm running off the top of my head, so I could be wrong, but yeah. I don't know, actually. Yeah, yeah, like um, a little piece but, of, of but, Saturn. It's very small. It's very small. That's but, right. But it, but it was chosen to fit a galaxy, like like. Well, like you're not going to get Andromeda in there, but you are no. going to get other you, galaxies in there. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So it was chosen. So if you think about it, so you want if it's too if that aperture is too small, you know, it's like squinting your eye, right? Like make your eye really small. If it's too small, then you're not going to let in enough light. And then it's like closing your eye. Well, that's bad. But if it's too big, then you're letting in more light from the object, which is great. But you're also letting in more sky. Uh, and it turns out that the things we're interested in, these are distant, very distant objects. I mean, Desi's probing out to what are called Lyman alpha quasars out to redshifts of four. So this is the universe is of order a billion years old, uh, a billion and some change at that point. Um, so these objects are far fainter than the just the sky background. So the more sky you let in, uh, sky is noise. It's a source of signal that we don't care about. Um, but every photon we detect from the sky, uh, you know, masks or obscures um, the uh, the light from the object we're interested in. Um, anyway, so that's the balance. So we want it not big enough that we can maximize the light that we're getting, but not so big that we're dominated by what's called the sky brightness. Now I've been like really impressed at, at the photographs that are coming from the dark energy survey. Cause I had assumed it would be more similar to say the Sloan survey, like tiny little galaxies that are hard to really make out, but there've been some phenomenal pictures that have come out from this instrument. Is that is that just like are they like taking a different kind of picture or is it being done with these fiber optic cables? Good, yeah. So I, I, there's a little correction in here because you mentioned the dark energy survey, and this is where astronomers get in trouble by reusing acronyms. Um, so the dark energy survey or DES uh, is a different survey. Um, than the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. You know, we like, astronomers like throwing dark in front of things because we, the funding agencies like them. Um, so, so the dark energy survey um, is, is different. This was uh, a survey whose goals were similar to try to understand dark energy. Um, it, they, it was an imaging survey using a camera called the dark energy camera uh, at CTIO in Chile. Um, right. Okay. Okay. So I'm just getting them confused in my head. No, it's fine. I mean, they're, they're built yeah. on each other. DS is a stage three dark energy experiment trying to use weak lensing uh, and other tracers to understand dark energy. Um, the images there from that survey are, I, I mean, this does actually connect with, with the Atlas. Um, uh, the images there are phenomenal because they took extremely deep uh, exposures, very deep, uh, um, lots of images to uh, to trace out really faint, distant objects, uh, but no spectroscopy. And that actually ends up being one of the big challenges is 
you know, you can see a lot of detail, you can see really faint distant objects, but unless you can disperse the light and get its redshift, um, there's a large uncertainty in how far away it is, what its, what its redshift is. And this is why DESI is breaking into new ground and what makes it a stage four dark energy experiment. So um, it's... So it's kind of like more like half of Euclid, like Euclid's got these two roles that it's doing. It's got the visible light instrument that's observing the size and shape of these galaxies. And then it's got the infrared side of things, which is helping to, to figure out the spectroscopy and figure out what it's made out of and, and so on. And it's doing those two things. So yeah, and, and with the original the, with the phase three, you were looking at the sizes and shapes and getting really subtle using the, the lensing, but yeah. not not getting the kind of light that you need to do spectroscopy. Yeah, and right. uh, you know Euclid's fantastic, but even there, the spectroscopy is going to be—I uh, uh, don't want to say poor, but I'll say poor compared to what Desi is doing. So mm. we're getting very high-resolution spectroscopy, meaning uh, the number of wavelength channels that we split the light into um, is uh, is there are many more pixels than what Euclid will do. Now we're a ground-based instrument versus space-based. Um, and I'll never, you know, under undermine any data, right? I'm an astronomer. I'm I'm, I'm selfish. I want more photons. Um, but uh, but there are a number of advantages to being able to isolate the light of the objects you're interested, in and also being able to get more detailed spectroscopy. Right. Uh, so let's talk about dark dark energy then. Um, like what you know as you're gathering this redshift data the spectroscopic data from all of these relatively nearby galaxies but also these quasars that are redshifted out to just a billion years after the big bang what will you do with that date with those data to try to start to puzzle out the impact of dark energy in the universe yeah so uh so there are a few different science thrusts. Let me focus in on dark energy one and, and the specific technique we're using to, uh, um, to constrain dark energy. Uh, so you and your audience might be familiar with the idea of a standard candle. So this is how uh, dark energy was first kind of observationally confirmed in the late 90s. Um, and I was actually a, a lowly undergrad at UC Berkeley when the at least the Berkeley team was like, you know, gathering the data. And uh, so I'm distantly connected. You know, I'm going to reach out and say, hey, I was a part of that energy. Um, so the idea of a standard candle is if you know, uh, so let, it comes back to distances. If, if you know the distance to the object, there's a lot you can do um, to figure out the matter and energy content actually, and also the geometry of the universe. So with a standard candle, it's like a 100-watt light bulb, right? If you know it's 100 watts and I hold it in front of you and you measure how bright it appears, you can figure out its distance. It's the one of our squared law. If I put it over the edge of the universe, it's still a 100-watt light bulb. Uh, and so it's fainter. It appears fainter, but it only appears fainter because that light has been spread out over a larger sphere. Um, so in DESI, we're using what's called a standard ruler. Um, so there the idea is, you know, this pen is however many inches wide. So again, you can measure how its apparent angular size, whether it's here or far away. Uh, and so by combining the, the distance that you infer, and I haven't told you what the ruler is, um, with the redshift, uh, you can now figure out uh, what the content, energy content of the universe is between here and there. So the technique is called baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, it's BAO, um, uh, and the the technique is it's statistical. So what we find is that because of some physics in the early universe, so before uh, matter and photons decoupled and produced what we see as the relic radiation of the hot big bang called the cosmic microwave background. Um, there were there were over densities, excess um, kind of peaks of matter that were propagating out um, while everything was coupled together. So this is like dropping a, a pebble in a lake and you see, you know, the, the water kind of comes out and then propagates out and eventually that over density of matter smooths back out. So uh, it turns out the physics of the early universe was, was is relatively simple. Uh, it may appear complicated, but 
um, is really fairly simple uh, plasma. And so the distance, you can calculate the distance that uh, the density waves propagated in the amount of time since the, since the Big Bang to about a redshift of 1100 or about 400,000 years after uh, the early universe, after um, the Big Bang. Um, so that distance um, is the baryon acoustic oscillation feature. Uh, we see it in the power spectrum from the Planck satellite. Um, the power spectrum just tells you kind of the amplitude of those fluctuations. And so this is just that first one. And so this is just like a sound wave. Uh, um, so like you, you know, you hit a drum, um, it'll, there'll be a certain tone that is set by the size of that, that drum or, or acoustic instrument. So it turns out that after decoupling, after uh, photons and matter decoupled from each other, uh, and photons were able to travel, uh, there was just a slight excess of matter at this length scale. It's about 150 megaparsecs. So that's 150 million parsecs, about a factor of three for light years, so 450 million light years. Uh, so really big, right? The the galaxy, you know, the Milky Way galaxy is you know, 20 or 30 million light years. So in between galaxies, not within a certain galaxy. So, uh, so the way this technique works is we, we say, okay, for this galaxy, let's count the number of galaxies that are a certain distance away from that galaxy as a function of, of kind of radial bins. Uh, so nearby, you expect galaxies to have other galaxies near them, and that's because of gravity. Uh, there's a natural clustering that galaxies don't avoid each other, they, they get pulled in towards each other. So really nearby, we see an excess of galaxies near other galaxies compared to a random distribution. It's always it's a probabilistic statement. And if that, was, uh, if that was it, then as you went further and further away from galaxies, you expect fewer and fewer galaxies. But it turns out, if you think about the clustering, uh, the, or the number of galaxies from a certain galaxy is a function of distance, it goes down and then there's, a, I'm not on the scan, it goes down and then there's a little ac excess. And it turns out that excess is at about 150 megaparsecs in co-moving, so taking out the expansion of the universe. And that's called the BAO peak, the Baryon Acoustic Oscillation Peak. So if you know the, the distance, if you know the, sorry, the intrinsic size, which is this 150 megaparsecs set by the physics of the early universe, you then measure how big it appears in angle, and that's it. You get the distance and turn the distance into a, uh, a constraint on dark energy. And I mean, it's still so mind boggling to me that these sound waves, like even that sound could move through the early universe through yeah. the, the, you know, the time when, when the entire universe was like the inside of a star or like the, you know, the surface of a star. And then finally you got this moment where the, the photons decoupled from the matter and then it was everything started to move out. But those, but those ripples, those sound waves are kind of yeah. baked into the universe and the large scale structure of the universe that we see today, all of these giant walls and, you know, groups of galaxies yeah. are roughly following the peaks and troughs in the sound waves that were present in the early universe. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, mind blowing to think about. True. Yeah, yeah. But, and so, yeah. and so, you're looking for, you know, because this technique allows you to measure a distance in the universe. Yeah, you're trying to see if if the positions, like if if it's always been this smooth evolution from the the over densities in the early universe to the large scale structure of the universe today. Was it all? was it always smooth and how much of this is, is accounted for by dark energy? Yeah, exactly. So if you didn't have this extra, you know, pressure, this extra, I, I don't want to call it a force, uh, but, um, you know, matter and energy, uh, affect how the universe expands. And so you expect that peak to be at a, you always expect that peak because of just the physics of the early universe, whether there was dark energy or not. But where you would measure it would change. 
Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a constraint on how much uh, galaxies have moved away from each other because of, uh, because of dark energy. Uh, and you need, just a key point is you need those redshifts. You need to know, because we're counting how many galaxies are far from this one. Well, if you have two galaxies that look like they're near each other, but this one's actually over here, right. then that's no good. Uh, you need spectroscopy. Right. If you have a searchlight beside a firefly, right, uh, or if you have a searchlight or fireflies very close to your face and a searchlight is, is uh, 20 kilometers away, but they look the same brightness. Yeah. They look like they're close together and gravitationally interacting with each other, you know, if it, if it were the universe, Good. but they're not, they're very right. far away. Um, so when do we think dark energy started to dominate? Because we know, you know, now we know that it is whatever, uh, 80, some, what, 70% of the universe is dark energy, like some that. giant number. Yeah. When did it start to enter and start to play a significant role in the universe? Yeah, so uh, the, the um, dark matter, dark energy uh, equality point <laughs> or the point where dark energy started to dominate was at a redshift of about 0.8. Um, if I can convert that to time, maybe 4 billion years ago. Um, right, right. So like about 7 billion, <laughs> 7 billion years ago, 4 billion years after the beginning of the universe? Uh, no, I'm sorry. 4 billion years ago. Um, I could okay. look this okay. up very quickly, but, but yeah. less you than... You need a redshift. Yeah, redshift time. What do you need? Redshift point eight. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, point seven, point eight, something like that. Are you literally doing the math? Yeah, I'm doing it right now. Okay. Good. Uh, hold on. Hold on. How bad I am. Uh, so light travel time is six point nine billion years. So about 7 okay. billion years ago, seven billion and the billion age years. was 6.8. So almost 7 billion years. So okay. really it's almost like a split. It's like okay. half so the age the of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what uh, the reason, so what's happening though, so dark energy, the reason uh, dark matter used to dominate and dark energy dominates today is because it appears to be driven by, by the size of the universe itself. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a force or a phenomenon that comes from space time itself. So the larger the universe is, the more dominant it becomes. And so if you, uh, and the expansion is exponential. Uh, so the larger, you know, the more time passes, the more dominant dark energy is going to be become. And so part of a big piece of this is where are we going, right? How is the universe going to end? Uh, and there's a difference between if it's a cosmological constant, which is uh, consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity, um, it's actually an integration constant in the same way that G, big G, the gravitational constant is. Uh, if it's a constant, then we're kind of screwed because the universe will expand forever and right, the, the, the idea is the big rip, right? Like even, even the, at some point, the space between the sun and the earth, I mean, will be long gone because sun will evolve into a red giant, but picture, picture that, right? Like even then stars, even in, within a galaxy will start to uh, uh, be redshift, redshifted away because the dark energy uh, just dominates. But if it's not a constant, if it's something a little less than that, something dynamic, the idea there's uh, quintessence, then who's to say it's not going to turn around, right? We might have an epoch where we're accelerating and then all of a sudden we start to slow down again and then maybe contract as a universe at an accelerating pace. Uh, so at this point, the theory is all over the map. Uh, we, we don't have a good... Um, theoretical foundation for uh, what dark energy is and where what its physical origin is. Um, you know, it's like trying to, if you didn't have Newton's theory of gravity, you drop a pen, maybe you have a theory of gravity. Uh, and so that works. But I think little angels are on this pen pushing it downward, right? Or I'm Aristotle, and it's got more earth than air, therefore it falls, right? Those are all um, perfectly defensible uh, theories absent of physical theory that can make predictions. So, so that's, now, uh, that's where we are. I, I might be a little confused. Um, my understanding and tell, tell me where I'm wrong here is that the, you know, that the amount of dark energy present in any volume of 
the universe is the constant. The more the more universe you get, the more dark energy you get. That accelerates the expansion of the universe, but it doesn't necessarily lead to that big rip scenario. It's that if you get a changing amount of dark energy per volume of space, that's when you start to move into those big rip scenarios. So we may be, uh, so I, make sure we're using the same terminology or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I thought it was, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to address that. Uh, okay. All like, right. and maybe I'm just misremembering what exactly the big, big rip is, but I think about it simply that if, if there's yeah. nothing to cease or, or pull away from, uh, this extraordinary expansion, then at some point, um, I mean, we don't know, right? This is all hypothetical. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But like, like my understanding is that like just the, like we know that space itself has, like if you took away all of the energy, all of the, all of the stars, all of the matter, everything out of space, there would still be something there. There's just this, the existence of space time. And this is what Einstein had predicted, that you have this, this presence of space time and that that is, has a certain amount of energy density that just exists in the universe. And, and... And then, so the universe must be either expanding or or contracting. Like it can't be stable. And then, right. and then Einstein was like, "Oop, this was my mistake. Uh, I'm going to remove this. I'm going to figure out a way to to get rid of this cosmological constant because he figured it had to be there." Yeah. And and then astronomers found it. And and yeah. of course he was long dead. But right again, yeah. right. Um, but but it's you know I mean we see things like the Hubble tension. Which are which are coming up with these different measurements for the expansion rate of the universe at 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 in the in the Planck data in the cosmic microwave background, and then we see something dip in the sort of larger in the Cepheid variable measurements that are being yeah. done relatively nearby. Yeah, that's a wonderful you know, phenomenon right now. The the right. the Hubble tension. That's well, the tension. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Something exciting like to look at. New yeah. physics, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe yeah. or. Or, or, or maybe Adam, Adam Reese and team doesn't know how to do Cepheid variable measurements very well. You know, uh, someone take his Nobel Prize away from him. I don't know. Right. Pretty convincing work. So. Yeah. yeah. So, so then, like, is the hope or one of the possibilities from this survey that will pop out is an explanation for the Hubble tension? Uh, so, no. So, this particular technique, uh, the BAO technique, is not sensitive to the Hubble constant. Uh, so, um, now that said, we do, there are what are called joint analyses. So we can, we can constrain certain cosmological parameters. This particular technique is more sensitive to dark energy content, uh, equation of state. Um, and then if you combine it with cosmic microwave background measurements, then you can, uh, look for consistency or you know if you have one constraint this way another constraint this way these are probability ellipse curves and if you multiply them then you can get tighter constraints um but but uh yeah this this particular survey the desi survey is not going to resolve uh, mm. the Hubble tension right but how do you see it? Like, like you mentioned this one, you mentioned Euclid, of course, Nancy Grace Roman is coming online yeah. in just a few years. Vera Rubin comes online next year. Maybe it, it's almost like you got four different giant flagship observatories and, and coming together all at the same time. Do you think dark energy can withstand, hold its mysteries beyond these four telescopes? Trying to solve it? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. I want to say I'm. I'm not arrogant enough to think that it's done for, right? And I think that's a good thing because I'd be out of a job if we, you know, solved it. And you know, a, a recurring joke I, my colleagues and I make is, eventually everything gets solved, and so why work on anything? Just wait until someone solves it. So, uh, I think just like the discovery of dark energy being important was new, something new. There were like rumblings and hints and like, oh, it's not really, we like a flat universe, but Omega matters 0 0.2, 0 0.3, like what's going on? Uh, there were, there were, you know, clouds on the horizon, but they're not clouds, right? They're just, uh, our, we're, le we're, we're gaining a deeper understanding of, of the universe. Um, 
And, and within all of that, I mean, that's like basic stuff, right? If you think about it, just cosmology, uh, what is our universe? We're, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. Just the Hubble tension, maybe there's some e a, a evolutionary term, um, how dark energy arises, that's new physics, you know, what, what is, what's going on there? If you think about it, it's like just drawing a picture, essentially, of where we live. We're still at a really fairly basic level. Uh, what I'm really excited about with, um, with the surveys and facilities you mentioned is, is just that discovery space. The questions we're not even asking today, uh, and time domain is a big piece of that, is we observe a static universe for the most part, but there is a there are things going on right now with gravitational waves, uh, you know, flares from supermassive black holes, moving objects uh, that you have to be observing continuously in order to observe those. Uh, and so uh, with the Rubin telescope in particular, the ability to observe the entire um, sky that's visible from Chile every three nights, that's going to add that sort of third dimension uh, of time uh, into our, our observations. So anyway, so it, it's exciting times. Uh, it's always exciting to be a part of astronomy, but I think the next decade or two are going to be even more. Yeah. Uh, well, John, what are you obsessed yeah. with right now? Oh, my goodness. What am I? I'm obsessed with my grant renewal. Um, okay. So <laughs> classic yeah. scientist answer. That's right. Yeah. I do have to pay, you know, my students and myself. Um, uh, but that's, that's actually a good process. Uh, this is how, uh, you have to, you have to justify your work. Uh, it is not sufficient to say, well, I've gotten funding before, so you should keep funding me. Uh, so it actually allows you to step back and say, what am I working on? Is it, What's the, I said the derivative earlier, what's the derivative of my work? I can only do so much. Uh, so you want to maximize your, your ability to do science, contribute to ongoing science. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we veered from the Siena Galaxy Atlas, which maybe speaks for itself, and you can invite me back for the next version, but uh, into dark energy, which is fine. Um, I am working on the next version of the Atlas. We actually have... Uh, this was uh, 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 finalized in 2020. Uh, it does play an important role in the dark energy spectroscopic instrument survey. Um, so we're working on the next version um, using more data, um, folding in DESI spectroscopy um, over a larger area. Uh, so that, that's part of it. Um, I am working, I'm a little obsessed with GPUs. Um, so... Uh, and this, at the scale of these data sets, we talked a little bit about big data. Once you start getting into the millions, tens of millions, you actually have to worry about compute time. So you have to think about parallelization and how efficiently uh, you can analyze things. So if I can write a piece of code today that, you know, take tens of hours and it's done, but I really want to do it 10, 20, 30 times, and I can't do that. Uh, and so there have been some really exciting developments in hardware um, of, from CPUs to GPUs, which allow, this is why games are so fantastic. Um, so uh, now that's not my area. So I'm actually having to teach myself both the software and the hardware side of things. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I mean, those are a couple of things that I'm working on. They're more technical, but kind of at my stage, my career stage, uh, these are, I can take the time to teach myself these things and, and try, to, um, try to do more with, with, with fewer resources. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, like the crypto boom is busting. And so all of these GPUs are being available in the market now. And finally, we can play our video games again. Yep. And I guess train AI. Uh, but you know, hopefully you can get your hands on an A100 and, and use it to calculate uh, spectroscopy data. That would be delightful. Uh, yeah. John, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thanks for explaining this. When do I get to sort of take your map, the Sienna Galaxy map, put it into my video, you know, some video game and use that to explore the a realistic version of the nearby cosmos? That's a great idea or a great question. So I've actually, 
Uh, I hope everyone has come across a, a so-called coffee table book. Uh, you know, Hubble often dominates that market, like just big, big book you put on your coffee table. Just look through these amazing images. So right now, your ability to explore the atlas is somewhat static. But I've been thinking about a way to bring that, um, you know, the VR, AR uh, technology into kind of the next gen coffee table book. So a, nothing in the works. Or a 3D printed block of of some kind of clear plastic that has <laughs> the positions of all the galaxies around the Milky Way, you know, that you can then sort of study it. That would be yeah, cool. I don't know. I'm thinking more like Iron Man, you know, like just right, right, right. and like move it around. And, and uh, so I, I think those that um, the ability to do that uh, technologically exists. Uh, the time doesn't exist. So if you have some tech ideas, come on over. We'll all right. Together. That sounds great. All right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks for talking to me today. All right. I'm going to talk about this some more and some additional interviews that I think you would enjoy. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modso, George, David Gilton, and Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I mentioned in the interview that we really are moving towards this survey era in astronomy. And when you think about that first work with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, how laborious the process must have been to understand a map of the sky, to make physical metal plates that you could put in front of your instrument to drill holes where each of the galaxies were that you wanted to observe. And then the evolution of that to where they would be able to configure fiber optic cables on a plate that was in front of the instrument to this modern era where little robots are moving around each one of 5000 fiber optic cables on your instrument to capture just the galaxy you want and not all that additional noise and light like the work on surveys is just amazing. And then you match that to the other survey telescopes that are out there like Gaia, Vera Rubin. And it's like a meme on this channel that I always joke about how I'm always talking about Gaia and I'm always talking about Vera Rubin. What I'm really always talking about is surveys that you can go and think about the entire cosmos you have at your disposal in a computer database every galaxy that we know of, every star that we know of, every interesting object, every anomaly, and you can just search these giant surveys, take your results, study those results, and then do follow on observations with the big telescopes that can give you those answers. There is just at no point in astronomical history could astronomers say, I want to look at all 10,000 white dwarfs that we know of, or however many there are. At no point in astronomical history could a person say, you know, like, I want to compare all the white dwarfs that we know about, and then look for the one that has this property or that property, then go find it, do fallen observations. It really is a revolution in astronomy. I always say we're in the golden age of astronomy. We're in the golden age of astronomy. All right, a couple of interviews that I think you're going to enjoy. One is on dark energy and type 1a supernova, which have been used to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And astronomers have gone and very carefully gathered all 1500 type 1a supernova that have ever been observed and put them into what's called the Pantheon Plus survey. It is the most accurate, most careful survey of all of the type 1a supernova that's ever been done. And it's giving us some really good answers about dark energy and the potential possibility or not of the big grip. So check out that interview. And the other one is on Vera Rubin. And this is an interview with Dr. James Davenport. We talk about sort of how to search for life in the universe, an interesting idea that he had, but then we shift and spend most of the interview talking about the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's a wonderful interview, one of my favorites, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So two interviews to go from here. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you next time.